can tell, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Wong Fen uh, Sun from the National University of uh, Singapore. And uh, Wong Fen will give a series of lectures on the Korean web, the Korean net, and the Korean city. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, for the introduction and uh, thanks for the invitation. So, uh, for the first hour of uh, today's lecture, I will just use the slides and show you some pictures. So most people probably don't know what is a Browning web and Browning net. So my hope is uh, to just give a general idea of what is a Browning web and net, how do they arise in uh, different models, and uh, just to motivate uh, this uh, topic. And then afterwards, I will uh, use the blackboard to go through uh, the details of uh, Browning web, Browning net, and some applications uh, in the remainder of this uh, course. Okay, so the topic of the Browning web uh, originally started uh, with the PhD thesis of uh, Richard Aradia in 1979. So in his PhD thesis, he considered uh, the following model. So there is a classic interacting particle system known as a Volder model, which is uh, depicted uh, here. So the Volder model in this case, this is a one-dimensional Volder model. So there's an integer lattice. At each position of the integer lattice, the particle carries one of two values, either 0 or 1. So these can be regarded as the opinions of, uh, say, uh, two different political parties. So they carry two different political opinions. And the dynamics uh, is the following. So independently at each lattice site, with exponential rate 1, uh, the voter at this location is going to look to either the neighbor on the left hand side or the neighbor on the right hand side. So these are represented by the arrows. So for example, at this side, the voter at this time instant, a clock rings and the voter looks to its left neighbor. And when this happens, what it does is that it simply changes its opinion to that of the neighbor which it looks to. So therefore, what we are seeing here is a collection of arrows and this determines which voter at which time should uh, change its opinion to that of its neighbor. So this is called the Harris uh, graphical construction of the voter model. So for example, at this time, so here you have a zero, so the voter has opinion zero, and it does not change until all the way up to this time, then it looks to its neighbor. So here the opinion mode, uh, voter's opinion is initially one. At this time instant, it looks to its left neighbor, which carries opinion zero, so from this time onward, the voter at this location also carries opinion zero. So that is a, a classic interacting particle system known as the voter model, and uh, it, is also, uh, it also has applications in population genetics because it models uh, sort of the uh, evolution of the population with the effect of resampling. So this effect of looking to your neighbor and change your opinion to your neighbor, that is known as a resampling effect. Now, this voter model is known to, dual, to be dual to a system of coalescing random walks. So this is a classic interacting particle system duality. In this picture, what it means is that if you look at uh, the value of the voter at this particular space-time point, where does it come from? Well, all you need to do is to trace back in time and look at its uh, genealogy. Where does, it, where does uh, its voter, where did it inherit its uh, opinion? So the last time, we see that it can, the opinion actually is inherited from this neighbor, which it looks to. So therefore, along this green line, the voter's opinion actually is constant. And it represents the genealogy of this voter at this space-time point. So if you trace back the arrows downward in time, then you see that this space-time point should carry the voter opinion of zero. And similarly, if you take another space-time point, you want to look at what should be the voter's opinion at this location in this time, then you trace back the arrows until your initial condition, and you see that it is a one. If you look at uh, a single genealogy, you see that this is just a random walk in continuous time. Because the Poisson arrow, so these arrows follow Poisson point process because they are generated by Poisson clocks. So when you look backward in time, these are still Poisson point processes. So if you follow this backward in time, this is nothing but a continuous time random walk. If you look at the joint genealogies of two individuals at different space-time points, then you see that they evolve independently as random walks until when they meet. Once they meet, then they coalesce into a single genealogy. So basically, they have found a common ancestor, the most recent common ancestor for these two uh, population, uh, two individuals. 
So that is uh, the model, model model, which is dual to the coalescing random walks. So you can look at the joint collection of coalescing random walks starting from every possible state space time point. So you can start the random walks at every position at every, uh, time t, but you can also start from every possible time. The only thing is that if you start, say, another random walk here, well, they coalesce immediately. So it doesn't really matter if you start the more coalescing random walks. It's still well defined in this picture. Now, the basic question that uh, Aratia wanted to address is, if I take the diffusive scaling limit of this picture of these coalescing random walks, what is the scaling limit? So let's uh, look at the discrete time analog of this picture. So here, I'm now drawing discrete time random walks instead of continuous time <laughs> random walks. So this is discrete time nearest neighbor random walks on the integer lattice. The horizontal direction is space, and the vertical direction is time. So if you want the random walk to coalesce, then essentially you just use half of the integer lattice because of the parity. The space-time coordinates have to add up to an even number. So this is the realization of these discrete coalescing random walks on this even space-time integer lattice. And uh, given such a realization of these coalescing random walks, we ask the question is that if you scale space by, say, epsilon and time by epsilon squared, what happens to this picture? What is the limit? So in one word, the, um, the, the short answer is that the limit is what we'll call the Brownian web. So you can see that uh, what happens to a single trajectory. If I just look at the trajectory, the co co coalescing random walk starting from the space-time origin, then we know that by Donsker's invariance principle, this converges to a Brownian motion, a standard Brownian motion. If I look at, say, two space-time points, and look at a coalescing random walk starting from these two different space-time points, if the initial uh, distance is far away so that on the diffusive scaling they converge to, de to deterministic starting points, then they will simply converge to coalescing brown emotions. So here, take this brown emotion and uh, another brown emotion over there. So these are probably too smooth to be brown emotions, but uh, uh, you get the idea. So if I take two different space-time points, suitably spaced apart, then they converge to coalescing brown emotions. And you can do this for a finite number of these coalescing random walks. Now, the only thing that is non-trivial here is the fact that in the discrete picture, coalescing random walks are starting from everywhere in space and time. And when you take the continuum limit, then the starting positions in space-time will become essentially the whole plane, R2. How do you define coalescing brown emotions starting from everywhere in R2, in the space-time plane R2? That becomes a non-trivial question. So that is why the Browning web is more than just coalescing brown emotions, because the caveat is that the coalescing brown emotions starting from everywhere in space and time. And of course, this is restricted to one-dimensional space, because when you go to high dimensions, brown emotions do not meet, so there is no coalescence. So this picture is restricted to one dimension. So what uh, Richard Aradia did in his PhD thesis was to look at coalescing random walk starting from time equal to zero. So just restrict your starting positions and, uh, to positions on the integer lattice at a specific time t equal to zero instead of everywhere in space and time. So that is a bit simpler. And uh, he showed that you can take the continuum limits and what you get is coalescing brown emotion starting from the whole real line at t equal to zero. So that is already not entirely trivial because even on the real line at a given time, there are still uncountable number of starting points. So that is uh, something that he worked out in his PhD thesis. And uh, in his uh, 81, in 81, he had an unpublished manuscript where he proposed to generalize this to brown emotion starting from everywhere in space and time. And uh, he uh, laid down the basic ideas of how to construct this object, but the manuscript was never completed, so it was never published. And uh, it was not followed up until the work of by Balintos and Vangelin Werner in 98, where this Browning web turns out to play an essential role in the construction of a process known as the true self-repelling motion. So I explain a little bit about the true self-repelling motion or rather it's a discrete uh, space-time analog uh, later in these uh, slides. So, uh, so that's a Tolstom-Werner, which essentially completed the construction of this continuum limit. 
And uh, in the subsequent work by Fontes, Isobi, Newman, and Ravi Shankar, uh, they introduced the topology for the Browning web so that uh, the Browning web becomes a polished valued random variable. So this facilitates uh, uh, results such as proving weak convergence to the Browning web. And uh, they were modeled from different, uh, they were modeled in different directions. So they were considering basically aging dynamics of uh, aging of dynamics of one dimensional uh, zero temperature stochastic easing and post models. So they were really uh, coming from the physical uh, point of view. And the Brownian web happens to play uh, the essential role in studying aging for these uh, dynamics of uh, easing and post models. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the coalescing random walks is dual to the Volder model. So once you have a system of coalescing random walks, we know how to specify the Volder model. The Volder model. You simply trace along the coalescing random walk until you find your initial condition, and that defines the Volder's opinion at this given space time point. Now, when you take the continuum limit, the coalescing random walks become, become this collection of coalescing brown emotions, the Browning web. And in particular, from each space time point, there is a brown emotion which goes backward in time and hits time zero. So you can specify your initial condition, zero once or whatever you want, or any function. And this allows you to define a continuum analog of the Volder model because you basically have all the genealogies. The genealogies are provided by the coalescing brown emotions. And given the genealogies and given the initial condition, you know exactly which ancestor should they trace back to at time zero and therefore you should inherit the value of your ancestor. So this is, uh, the Browning web essentially gives a graphical construction of the continuum analog of the Volder model. So people have studied this as well, and this is known as the continuum sites uh, stepping stone model. So there's another feature of this uh, coalescing random walks that is interesting and uh, that will provide a very important tool for the analysis, and that is the duality. So here the duality is essentially the same as the percolation duality, percolation, bound percolation on the square lattice. The only difference is that here the edges are directed. So I mentioned that because of parity, you should only consider coalescing random walks on the even integer lattice where the space-time coordinates add up to be even number. So that leaves the other half, the odd integer lattice, space-time integer lattice, where the two coordinates add up to be an odd number. So that is drawn in these blue arrows going downward in time here. So the condition of the duality is that the downward blue arrows should not cross the forward, upward black arrows. So that's the same as in percolation. The dual model in the, du so at, in the bound percolation on the square lattice, the dual graph in the dual percolation model, the edges should not cross the open edges in the original percolation model. It's the same duality here. And now what you see is that the dual picture of these blue arrows, they basically give rise to a system of coalescing random walks also. And it's equally distributed with the original system apart from a time reversal. So there's a natural self-duality for this collection of coalescing random walks in this discrete picture. And uh, they are related to each other, or rather they determine uniquely each other based on the constraint that the forward random walk trajectories should not cross the backward trajectories. And now you can ask, what is the scaling limit of this joint picture? The forward random walks and the dual random walks, when you take the diffusive limit of these, these two objects simultaneously, what do you get? Well, you should get two Browning webs. One is going forward in time, and the other, the other one is going backward in time. They are equally distributed apart from a time reversal, but they are related to each other, or they almost surely determine each other by the relation that the trajectories, the forward trajectories, should not cross the backward trajectories. So this non-crossing condition actually also allows you to say that the Browning web and its dual uniquely determine each other. So we'll come back to this picture again. Yeah. That's right. It's the same notion of duality. Well, usually when we talk about duality, it's basically involving one process going forward in time, another process going backward in time. But somehow, the two processes utilize the same space-time randomness. 
So the same randomness is being used to construct the forward process and the, dual, uh, and the backward process. So that is essential, the strongest duality that uh, one can formulate for this uh, interacting particle system duality. Usually, interacting particle system duality is formulated in terms of test functions. But at the deeper level, when uh, I'm inclined to claim that there is a graphical duality where you, if you specify the randomness, then the two processes are basically using the same randomness. So this here, it's, uh, it's exactly the same. <coughs> so in general, Browning web should arise as the diffusive scaling limits of one dimension interact interacting particle system where there is single particle motion, which gives Browning motion, and then there is coalescence between the particles. And uh, potentially there are dependence, but uh, in the limit, the dependence should only appear in the form of coalescence. So here is a model which motivated uh, Fontes, Isobi, Newman, and Stein to look at uh, the scaling limit to look at the Browning web. So they were looking at zero temperature limit of stochastic POTS models. So here, what I've drawn is that, uh, so it, the domain is basically, so the vertical direction is time, horizontal direction is the space, and each color represents a, basically a region of a single type of spins. So here you have these purple spins, here you have the green spins, yellow spins, etc. And uh, the different regions of different spins are separated by these so-called domain walls. And uh, this costs energy. So whenever you switch to a different type of spins, well, there's an interaction here which costs energy. So zero temperature limit just means that the evolution of these domain walls is such that the number of domain walls can only decrease. It cannot increase because it's zero temperature. So the energy should only decrease. So that's why the domain walls cannot, uh, you cannot, uh, the domain walls cannot branch. And there cannot be nucleations within a domain because this creates uh, new domains and uh, increases the energy. And there is still some dynamics because we are taking the zero temperature limit. So the effect of the noise will still persist in the zero temperature limit. It just means that each domain wall will move either left or right with equal probability because that does not change energy. The domain, domain wall moving left or right does not increase the number of domain walls, so that does not increase energy. So that's the stochasticity that remains in the zero temperature. So what you see is that the domain walls will evolve as independent random walks until two adjacent domain walls coalesce. When that happens, the significance is that this whole domain, the purple domain of spins, simply disappear. And the number of spin types is reduced by one. So what you see here is basically a collection of coalescing random walks if you want to analyze the evolution of these uh, domains of spins. And uh, when you take the scaling limit, of course, you get uh, coalescing brown emotions. So if you want to understand the question of aging or persistence, then the scaling limit, the Browning web, will be a necessary tool. So that's uh, motivation from uh, stochastic dynam dynamics of uh, POTS models in one dimension. There are other related models which uh, fall into the domain of attraction of the Browning web, converge to the Browning web. So here is a model considered by uh, Ferrari, uh, Fontes, and Wu, and that is uh, called a Poisson tree. So first you saw down a two-dimensional Poisson point process represented by these black dots. And uh, now you are, we are going to draw a tree structure among these Poisson points. So how is the tree structure drawn? From each Poisson point, we look at a cylinder going upward in time, which is centered at this Poisson point with radius equal to one. So within this cylinder, you look for the first Poisson point that you encounter in the time direction. And then you just draw an arrow or edge to that Poisson point. So this determines a tree structure. And uh, it has been shown by Ferrari, Fontes, and Wu that uh, this collection of trajectories by following these arrows or directed edges also converge to the Browning web. So this is uh, perhaps not hard to imagine because uh, there is a lot of independence given by the Poisson point process. So individual trajectories would converge to a brown motion and uh, there is coalescence and the weak coalescence, uh, so the weak dependence because they are only dependent when they are within distance two of each other. So there's weak dependence, so in the limit you just get uh, uh, coalescing brown motions. 
So for the Volta model, you can also generalize it to the case when it's not nearest neighbor, but then arbitrarily the sort of resampling kernel is given by the transition kernel of any general two-dimensional random walk, say with a mean zero and a finite variance. And this will give you a more general version of the Volta model. And you can still show that this collection of coalition random walks will converge to the Browning web. So this uh, sort of attests to the universality of the Browning web. Yeah. Okay. How do we even meet? Yeah, so this is still an integer lattice. I haven't drawn an integer lattice here. So when they come to the same lattice point, they meet. Now here's another model where you see a convergence to the Browning web. So this is a, a basically a collection of rightmost, rightmost infinite open paths in supercritical oriented percolation. So what I've drawn here is a realization of oriented percolation dimension one. So again, vertical direction is time. Independently, each edge is retained with probability p and not retained with probability one minus p. So the solid edges here, the solid arrows here represent the open edges in oriented percolation. And uh, if we restrict to the supercritical regime, then there will be vertices in this picture where there is an infinite cluster rooted at this vertex. So this means that you can follow some open paths all the way to infinity. So that's the definition of supercriticality. So what I've drawn here, these are blue arrows. Blue edges are simply trajectories that can be reached from time equal to zero to say infinity. And the green uh, edges are basically danglings. So if you follow the green arrows, then at some point you reach a dead end and you cannot continue anymore. Now, suppose that the origin of these red paths are vertices which have infinite clusters. So there will be, a, so take this uh, vertex for example. There will be a collection of arrows, there will be a collection of paths it can follow all the way to time equal to infinity. Now among all these paths, it's easy to see that you can always single out a rightmost infinite open path. So from each vertex which percolates, let's single out this rightmost infinite open path. So these are represented by these red arrows here. And now you can see that these red paths, of course, they are also coalescing paths. So this gives you a coalescing structure. And uh, what you can show Actually, it was shown by Kuchek in the late 80s or early 90s that if you look at a single such rightmost infinite open path, then under suitable scaling, it converges to a Brownian motion. Now the question that, yeah, dr drifted Brownian motion. A Brownian motion with a drift, that's right, a drift to the right, because we are looking at the rightmost path. Now if you look, uh, so the, the difficulty now is that if you want to look at a joint realization of this rightmost infinite open path, how to characterize the joint realization? Well, in this case, there will be dependence because infinite open path means that you look all the way to infinity. So it depends on the infinite future. And in particular, if you look at two such trajectories, well, they'll be dependent because both will depend on the infinite future and this uh, future will overlap. So there will be dependence between these trajectories. And, uh, how to handle this dependence and show that actually it is a weak form of dependence. Weak in the sense that when you take the scaling limits, what you get is basically coalition brand motion. So this is something that uh, one can actually prove. And the reason why, why there is weak dependence is because, uh, well, the way you construct this infinite open path is essentially through an exploration procedure. Uh, similar to uh, in the standard non-oriented percolation, you can also do exploration. Here, you can also perform an exploration procedure which gives you a whole cluster. And so for different vertices, you have different exploration clusters. And uh, these exploration clusters are actually very thin. On the macroscopic scale, it just looks like, look like a single path. And that's a key point which allows you to show that uh, eventually you get the uh, coalescing brand emotions. So these different exploration clusters, of course, they are independent before they intersect. And once they intersect, you can show that the rightmost infinite open paths will coalesce very quickly. So that's another model which falls in the domain of attraction of the Brownian web. By thin, you don't mean that complex. Okay. If you go left, most fast, it's a little bit different, right? 
Yeah, so if you draw the, if you want to find the leftmost path, of course this is different. But if you're only interested in the rightmost infinite open path, you don't need to care about the leftmost. So what you can do is that you can just sort of, uh, you, you start with the right edge, so from each vertex you start from the right edge, you see that if this one has descendants, if it has descendants, you again choose the rightmost one, and then you sort of, uh, if this one dies, then you go back, explore this one. If this one dies, you explore this one, and then you go back, and uh, so there will be a lot of danglings, but uh, if this is known as a percolation point, then you know that this exploration procedure can continue forever. You get a lot of danglings, but uh, apart from these danglings, you, are, you have this rightmost infinite open path. So if you consider the width, if you consider width here, the width is, very, is of order one. So when you take the scaling limit, these danglings are essentially, you can ignore it and they disappear. That's why the width of the branches and width of the places you have to explore, all these uh, other stuff uh, you can just ignore in the scaling limit. And that's what gives you independence. Okay, so now let's come to the true self-avoiding walk uh, that uh, was studied by Tost and Werner. And uh, its connection with the Brownian web is sort of uh, uh, non-trivial, I mean, it's. Uh, it's something that you have to work with in order to see the connection. One wouldn't just come up with it uh, uh, out of the blue. So let me first show you a realization of these coalescing random walks. So here you should uh, turn the picture around. So the coalescing random walks, the forward coalescing random walks are now moving to the left, while the dual coalescing random walks are now moving to the right. So the picture has sort of been turned around. And we also fix a boundary condition. So these, represent, these are given by these, uh, these random walk uh, edges, uh, random, random walk paths. So there is a leftmost random walk, there is a random walk moving to the left, which is zigzag, and there is also a dual random walk moving to the right, which is zigzag. And uh, then I just uh, draw a particular relation of these coalescing random walks with this boundary condition. The claim is that such a relation determines uniquely a trajectory which is the trajectory of the true self-avoiding walk. So let's see how that's, uh, this work. So you basically consider the space that is between the forward and the dual random walk trajectory. And that determines the motion of this true self-avoiding walk. So the first step, you start from this uh, space and then you, you have to go there, and then you have to go there because it has to fill the space in between. So this generates a lattice space filling curve and this lattice space filling curve is going to determine the motion of the true self-avoiding walk. So what uh, is a true self-avoiding walk's uh, position? Position is simply the horizontal axis, the horizontal coordinate. So you follow the tip of this path. If you look at the horizontal position, that will be the position of the true self-avoiding walk. And uh, because it's a space filling curve, you'll see that what is the meaning of the vertical coordinate? The vertical coordinate simply records the local time. How many times the random walk has visited this particular edge? So let me explain uh, what is the dynamics of this uh, true self-avoiding walk. So the dynamics corresponding to this picture is the following. So here is origin. Here is one, here is minus one. What uh, we do is the following. We first specify a local time profile on the, uh, on the edges of the integer lattice. So this has a local time profile equal to, uh, let me think, uh, I think it was a zero. So this is zero. And then at the next edge, it has local time profile minus one. And then this has local time profile one, uh, zero, minus one, et cetera, et cetera. So this represents the local time profile. at time zero. And the dynamics is the following. Whenever you are sitting at uh, a particular position x, and suppose that local time for the edge next to the left of it is say k, so this has uh, k, and this one has say l, 
and L is less than K, whenever you are sitting at a vertex where the local time on one side is strictly larger than the local time of the edge to the right, then the random walk simply moves to the right. And uh, so it always moves in the direction where the local time is smaller. So it is basically repelled by its local time. It is repelled by regions where it has visited more. So the random walk should cross over, over, uh, cross over to the right, and then the local time gets increased from L to L plus 1. And uh, when you are in a situation where the local time to the left and right are the same, suppose that both are L, then the random walk simply chooses one of the two neighbors, moves either left or right with equal probability, and the local time of this edge then gets increased by 1. So this is the true self-avoiding walk and uh, with the initial condition that corresponds to this picture here. So the basic statement is that if you look at uh, the joint movement of the local time and the position of the walk, then it can be represented by this picture. The realization of the random walk and its uh, local time evolution is essentially determined by the realization of this collection of forward and dual coalescing random walks with this particular boundary condition. So let's, uh, yeah, so this is just a sort of uh, another illustration of uh, the motion of the random walk uh, without the coalescing random walks. Now, since we know that coalescing random walks converge to the Brownian web, now you can ask what happens to the scaling limit of this true self-avoiding walk. So the coalition random walks converge to the Browning web and its dual. So this, the forward random walks will converge to a version of the forward Browning web with a boundary condition that there is just one pass, one forward pass going all the way to the left. The dual random walks converge to a dual Browning web with a boundary condition that there is a dual pass going all the way to the right. And uh, the ladder space filling curve in the continuum limit simply becomes a continuum space filling space uh, filling curve that sits between the Browning web and its dual. And uh, if you look at the horizontal coordinate, this is exactly the position of the true self-repelling motion. And uh, if you look at the vertical coordinate, so if you look at the vertical coordinate, it represents the local time of this motion uh, up to that time. So the vertical height here represents the local time of the process accumulated at this position up to this time. So using the Browning web and its dual, Close and Werner constructed the joint realization of the true self repelling motion at this local time. And this is basically a, uh, a continuum space fitting curve. So heuristically, this uh, motion is repelled by its local time profile. And, uh, they show that this process enjoys some unusual properties. So it has uh, an anomalous uh, scaling relation. Unlike Brownian motion, which is scaling invariant under diffusive scaling, here the scaling exponent is that if you multiply time by a factor of A, then you see that it is equivalent to multiplying the process in space by a factor of A to the power of 2 thirds. So it is uh, super diffusive with uh, exponent uh, given by 2 thirds. <clears throat> and it has finite variation of all the three halves. Okay, so that's uh, the true self repelling motion considered by Tolson and Werner. Now another model which also generates a Browning web in the scaling limit is a planar aggregation model considered, considered by Norris and Turner. Uh, it first appeared in the archive in 2008 and the final paper was uh, uh, published around uh, more recently. So this model is called the Hastings-Levitov uh, planar aggregation model. I guess the special case of the Hastings-Levitov uh, planar aggregation model. So what we do is the following. Initially, we start with a ball in R2. And now a small ball, a small particle in the shape of a ball is going to arrive from infinity and attach itself to the boundary of the ball uniformly. So basically governed by the harmonic measure of where it will arrive. So in this case, it's a uniform on the boundary. So this is the result of adding one particle. And uh, now what about the next step of the dynamics? Well, the model that they consider has a certain conformal invariant structure. So what they do is that they first map this new shape by conformal map into a ball. 
And under this mapping, you again get a ball. And then in this new picture, you add a ball from infinity and attach to it. But uh, you have to reverse this conformal map. So you apply the inverse of the conformal map back to the original picture, and you see that well, the shape of the ball, that the shape of the second ball you add actually is not really a ball, but uh, some uh, weird shape. So you get a new domain in the second step. And uh, for a third step, you apply the same procedure. Map this new domain into a ball, say into a ball, and then again attach a little particle in the shape of a ball to the boundary, and then you again reverse the conformal map, and you see that you if you iterate this procedure, then you start to see these fingers appearing because the fingers are where the harmonic measure concentrates. So the new particles are always attached to a location that is proportional or that is given by the harmonic measure of the, of the boundary. So these fingers will attract most of the new particles. Now where does the Browning web uh, or coalescing motions come in? Well, here is where they come in. So if you look at uh, the distance between the two, say so let's uh, take uh, three sample points on the uh, uh, original boundary x, y, z. If you measure the distance between these two points according to the harmonic measure, so let's uh, normalize, so on, in this new shape, you can again look at the harmonic measure of the boundary and uh, normalize to be, a, so, so it's basically the probability measure of a particle called infinitesimal particle coming from infinity, you see where does it get attached. And if you measure the distance between these points according to the harmonic measure, which is equivalent to saying that if I map this shape back into a ball, you look at the distance between these points, then you see that these points will get closer and closer. And they evolve basically like coalescing motions. So if you take uh, the limit where the particle size tend to zero and the arrival rate of the particles tend to infinity, jointly in a suitable fashion, then you'll see that in, the, in, the, in this limit, the motion of the boundary points is essentially a coalescing motion. And uh, in the two different particles, they evolve independently as Brownian motions on the circle until they meet. When they meet, then they stick together. So that's how the Brownian web, or in this case, the Brownian web on the circle arises from this uh, planar aggregation model. And uh, there are other models which uh, belong to the domain of attraction or are believed to belong to the domain of attraction of the Browning web. And these include the drainage network models, which look sort of similar to this Poisson tree I drew before. And uh, there is also a more complicated version, the two-dimensional directed spanning tree. And uh, that has a more complicated dependency structure when you follow the trajectories. In the Poisson tree, the dependency is very simple. You draw a cylinder, you look for the next point. In the, uh, in the two-dimensional spanning tree, what they do is that for each Poisson point, instead of looking at the cylinder around it and look for the next point, you look at uh, balls. You find the closest, smallest ball which contains the next Poisson point, and then you draw an arrow pointing this way. So this creates a complicated dependency structure because say another Poisson point here, these balls obviously will overlap, and this overlap creates a dependency which is sort of hard to handle. So that is why even though the two-dimensional directed spanning tree is believed to, conject to, con uh, is believed to con uh, converge to some version of the Browning web, but it has not been fully proved. Okay, now let me uh, sort of explain the Browning net. So the Browning net is a generalization of the Browning web where we now allow branching of, particle, uh, branching of random walks. So here, I modified the picture of the coalescing random walks by adding these uh, branching points. So all these, uh, uh, so these points, you see there is a branching into two walks. Now the question is, is there a non-trivial continuum limit, diffusive scaling limit of, these, uh, of this picture? So the answer is yes, provided that your branching probability is chosen to depend on your scaling parameter. So if I space scale space by a factor of epsilon, scale time by a factor of epsilon squared, how should I choose the branching probability? Or the branching probability should be chosen as epsilon, or more generally, as a constant times epsilon. And uh, the claim is that if I choose this weak form of branching, 
then this picture will converge to a limit, which is what we call the Brownian net. Uh, so just to explain quickly, why is this the correct uh, choice of the branching probability to have a non-trivial limit? Well, what we need to do is to, so here the problem is that there are too many trajectories. There are too many random walk paths starting from every point. You can, brown, I mean here you have a branching point, so you can go either left or right. Again, you have a branching point, we can go either left or right. So the number of trajectories you have to follow gets uh, increased uh, exponentially. Nevertheless, if you want to simplify the problem, what you can do is to simply follow the rightmost trajectory whenever you can. This way, you just need to follow a single trajectory starting from every space-time point. So here, at this branching point, I just follow the one to the right. And here, the green arrows, arrows are the ones which you follow the arrows to the left. So I, I just follow the arrow to the left, and this way, you see that you get a collection of coalescing random walks instead of branching coalescing random walks. So if the whole picture converges, then this smaller, this uh, sort of uh, restricted picture, the sub-picture of this leftmost coalescing random walk path should converge as well. And it's easy to see that what uh, is required for these green trajectories to converge. Because the green trajectories are simply coalescing random walks with drift given by epsilon. And now you see why do we choose epsilon? Because any other choice of the branching probability will give you a drift that either converges to zero or converges to infinity. It is the only the choice of constant times epsilon and the, with the space-time scaling by epsilon epsilon squared that you see that the leftmost trajectories will converge to brown emotions with drift equal to minus one. That is the only choice. And that essentially gives you a strong hint that there should be a continuing limit if you consider the full collection of branching coalescing random walks with this branching probability. And in fact, the way we construct this is by first consider the joint collection of leftmost random walks and the rightmost coalescing random walks show that the pair of coalescing random walks converge to a pair of Brownian webs. And then try to construct the remaining trajectory by concatenating leftmost trajectory and rightmost trajectory. So, there is an interesting feature that is preserved in this continuum limit, namely the branching structure. In the discrete lattice, you see these branching points. In the continuum, it is not at all clear that there will be analogs of these branching points because there will be trajectories everywhere. And uh, it's not clear that such a binary structure is preserved. But it turns out that uh, it is indeed preserved. In the continuum limit, you get uh, these special points which we call separation points or branching points, which are essentially analogs of the branching points in the discrete lattice. Of course, these branching points in the continuum, they are dense in space and time. So they are really everywhere. And uh, how to uh, understand this picture is uh, something that uh, one has to work on. But they can't be That's right, they are comfortably dependent. <coughs> so, this construction of the Brownian net that I just uh, sort of briefly mentioned is sort of outside-in construction. Outside in the sense that we first start with the extremal trajectories. The leftmost and rightmost trajectories, these are the extremal trajectories, and then we want to construct the trajectories that is in between, which are the Brownian net trajectories. So we call this an outside-in construction. And uh, separately, Newman, Ravi Shankar, and Scherzer gave an alternative construction which can be thought of as the inside-out construction. Inside-out in the sense that if I look at these branching coalescing random walks, given a realization of the branching coalescing random walks, we can actually sample a collection of coalescing random walks. Whenever you come to branching point, you simply sample one of the two outgoing edges with equal probability. So this will give you a, brown, uh, a collection of coalescing random walks which will converge to the Brownian web. And now the goal idea is try to construct the remaining trajectories starting from these uh, coalescing random walks. In the discrete picture, the way to do it is very simple. For each lattice point along the random walk trajectory, we simply turn it into a branching point with probability epsilon. And you do this for independently for every lattice point. Uh, if you think about it this way, uh, 
it's hard to visualize what should be the continuum limiting procedure. What would be the analog procedure in the continuum? Well, there's another way to look at it, namely that we think of the points where we switch as points of collision between a forward random walk trajectory and the dual random walk trajectory. And when you do the switching, for example, let's take this point. I want to open this point as a branching point. So this adds a new trajectory. And this new trajectory will remain in the continuum limit only if it is bounded on the left-hand side by a dual trajectory for a long time. Most of these dual trajectories, they start very early. Let's say, take this one. If I open this point, if I open this edge, you see that this edge doesn't do much. It quickly coalesces with uh, this, uh, this path. So opening an edge which uh, crosses a dual random work trajectory that started uh, just a little bit later, that doesn't really do much. The edges which you open that will cause a macroscopic effect are edges which are basically sitting at the intersection of a forward random walk trajectory and the dual random walk trajectory. It's these collision points when you open it into a branching point, you see that they have a macroscopic effect. So this is analogous to percolation where there is a notion of these uh, pivotal bonds. Whenever you have these uh, sort of two clusters meet at a pivotal bond, where you're turning the bond into open or closed or drastically change the contour of these clusters, these are the bonds which are important. So in this picture, it's similar. A lot of the points, when you turn it into a branching point, these are insignificant. They are not pivotal. But uh, some of them will be pivotal, and they correspond to the points of collision between forward and dual random walks. So in the scaling limit, of course, the forward and dual random walks become forward and dual Brownian motions. And they all hit each other. So the points where they hit each other is endowed with a natural measure, namely given by the local time, collision local time measure. So what you can do is basically put a Poisson point process on the points of collision between the forward and backward Brownian trajectories, uh, and uh, where the intensity measure is given by the collision local time measure. So this way, you get a countable dense set of Poisson points. And these points, you simply turn them into branching points in the Brownian web. And this gives you another construction of the Brownian net, which we call the inside-out construction. <coughs> OK, so uh, where does the Brownian net arise uh, from interacting particle systems? Well, for this uh, dynamics of the stochastic uh, easy and post model, the natural way to arise is to consider low temperature stochastic pulse model with uh, boundary nucleation. So I say new low temperature, low temperature in the sense that the number of domain walls can increase. In zero temperature, the energy cannot increase. So number of domain walls uh, cannot increase. The domain walls just move as random walk. But at uh, positive temperature, but say low temperature, then domain walls can still increase, but can only increase one by one at a time. So this means that at an existing boundary, it may branch, a new domain emerges, and the number of domain walls increases by one. Uh, and this precludes the uh, interior bulk nucleation. So if you increase the temperature further, then it's possible that in the interior domain, a new domain may also emerge due to uh, impurity or whatever. If a domain appears in the interior, then you introduce uh, two boundaries at the same time. So that is uh, more costly. So that's a sort of a lower order effect. If you only consider low temperature, then the number of domain walls can only increase by one at a time. And this basically corresponds to the emergence of a new domain at the existing uh, domain boundary. So that's called a boundary nucleation. So this generates a branching coalescing structure. And uh, you can show that uh, this converges to the Brownian net. For the Volta model, there is also a natural way to introducing uh, branching. And uh, the Volta model, which is dual to the branching coalition random walk, is called the biased Volta model. So what the, the biased Volta model does is the following. So we still have the resampling as depicted by the black arrows. So these are Poisson point processes. And whenever an arrow appears, the Volta at this side simply changes its opinion to that of the neighbor it points to. However, 
there is a second effect, which is the effect of selection. So what it does, so this is depicted by these uh, red arrows. And uh, they occur at a different rate. Now these red arrows are not always used. They are only used if the arrow points from a site with opinion zero to a site with opinion one. So only when the configuration at this time is zero and one, pointing from zero to one, then this arrow is utilized, so the zero is turned into one. This is the, the mirror image. So this is called the effect of selection, which gives a preference for voters of opinion one. And uh, you can see that how to, what is a way to determine the voter opinion based on this uh, graphical construction. So what you do is basically the following. You still follow the arrows backward in time. Now, you follow the black arrows backward in time, but now there are also these red arrows. So what you do is that you should also follow the red arrows, which, increase, uh, which creates the effect of branching. And uh, in this picture here, when you follow the arrows, the blue, sorry, the black and the red arrows, you see that you only trace back to a single ancestor. So this means that you have no choice but to set the voter opinion to be zero. And uh, here's a picture where if you trace the arrows backward in time, you see that there is a branching and it traces to two different potential ancestors. In that case, how do you determine the voter's opinion? Well, you simply check whether there is a one among the ancestors. As long as there are some ones among the ancestors, then the voter opinion should be set to one, correspond to this effective selection. So therefore, the bias the voter model is dual to this branching coalition random walks in this way. You just need to follow all possible trajectories and check whether there is a preferred type among all your potential ancestors. So that makes the picture a bit more complicated, but in principle, one can take the continuum limit and you get a Brownian net and you have a continuum analog of this biased voter model with the selection. So you can think of uh, the Brownian web essentially as a one-dimensional spatial analog of so-called Kimmons coalescent. So Kimmons coalescent is what people have studied a lot uh, in the genealogies of this Mora model, essentially a voter model on a complete graph. And you can also consider effect of selection which introduce, uh, introduces this uh, branching. So this is essentially one-dimensional analog, uh, one-dimensional spatial analog of this. So there's uh, another model where the Browning web and Browning net uh, sort of arises uh, very naturally. And that is uh, the scaling limit of random walks in one-dimensional ID space-time running environment. So here the environment is refreshed at every time. Again, time is in the vertical direction and the space is in the horizontal direction. So at each space-time lattice point, we specify an ID random variable between zero and one, which determines the probability that the random walk say, should say cross this edge or cross this edge. So here, the random walk coming to this side will choose the right edge with probability 0 0.28 and choose the left edge with probability 0 0.72. Now, the question that we want to ask is that if I scale space and time diffusively the same way as before, is it possible to choose a sequence of random environments in such a way that in the limit, I still get a random motion in a random environment? Of course, when you take this continuum limit, the environment will be in continuum space and time as well. And here, because the environment is ID in space and time, the continuum running environment should also satisfy this uh, property. When you restrict the environment to di disjoint space-time regions, then the environment should be independent. So the question is that, is there a suitable choice of the law of the environment as a function of the scaling parameter so that you get a limiting continuum running motion in running environment? So the answer is uh, yes, provided that your sequence the law of your sequence of environments given by mu epsilon here satisfies this relation. So multiply by q times one minus q and divided by epsilon, the scaling parameter, this sequence of finite measures should converge weakly to a limiting finite measure nu. If this holds, then you can show that there is a limiting running environment for the limiting running motion. And limiting running environment is essentially determined by this measure nu. Now, what does this condition entail? If you look at this convergence, because epsilon is going to zero, 
you see that what it happens is that most of the mass of mu epsilon has to convert to the boundary points 0 and 1. In the interior, the mass assigned by mu epsilon to the interior of the interval 0 to 1 should disappear. And uh, what it means is that essentially, up to first order approximation, if you don't do scaling, just look at the random walk on the lattice, you see that the environment essentially degenerates. It essentially becomes a collection of coalescing random walks. You either go to left or you go to right. But uh, under the scaling, you see something non-trivial. It is not just the coalescing brown emotions. It's something that still retains the feature of the running environment, and there is still a possibility of branching. So this is something that uh, uh, has been uh, first proposed by Lejeune Raymond in the context of uh, the theory of uh, stochastic flows of kernels, and then uh, studied by Lejeune Lemaire for a particular case when the mu epsilon are basically uh, uh, beta distributions and then it was generalized by Horde and Warren, and uh, uh, we studied uh, this uh, for the case. Uh, we basically constructed the running environment using the browning web and net. So it turns out that the limiting continuous random space-time environment can be constructed from the browning web and the browning net. So depending on which construction of the browning net you use, you can either use the outside-in construction or you can use the inside-out construction this uh, will lead to two different ways of uh, defining the running environment. Okay, so that's essentially uh, uh, what I want to, the pictures I want to show you uh, just to uh, motivate the study of the Browning web and net. And uh, so in the remaining, uh, in the remainder of this course, my plan is the following. I'll first uh, uh, explain how to construct the Browning web and uh, how to define topology, and uh, what are the basic properties of the Browning web, then I'll do the same thing for the Browning net. And uh, then I'll discuss uh, a coupling between the Browning web uh, and the Browning net, which involve this uh, Boson marking procedure I mentioned before. This inside-out construction and this outside-in construction essentially leads to a coupling between the Browning web and net. And uh, in the last part of the course, I want to explain the scaling limit of uh, these random walks in ID space time running environments. Uh, so that is the plan for the remainder of this course. Uh, I'm also working on lecture on the lecture notes for, uh, for this uh, material. And uh, uh, for what I want to talk about, uh, I'm on, on, almost finished. I'll probably finish it today. And uh, we can find a way to uh, uh, make it available. The full lecture notes, I still want to add uh, like one or two more chapters. So it will, uh, it will only be a preliminary version. Uh, so we'll see how to distribute this. Okay, so maybe this is a good time to take a 10 minute break. And uh, I'll start uh, with the construction of the Browning web afterwards. A while ago, I did some simulations to show that the uh, kind of two-dimensional analog of this should exist. I mean, of the evolution, not of not of particles, but but of curves, uh -huh. right? Uh, like what boundaries. do you mean by? Okay, so if you, okay, let's do the same. Uh, let's do the following thing. Have some regions in like the triangle lattice, for instance, two-dimensional triangle lattice. And they kind of compete along the boundaries. Uh, uh. The boundaries move either this way or that way, uh. <laughs> independently with mm -hmm. equal probabilities. Mm. It looks like these guys should have uh, should have some kind of continuum limit in which this these curves kind of. Uh, okay, so it's like a tessellation of the R two into different yes. uh, pieces. Yes. So that you can think of it as a tessellation. Yes. Or some sort exactly. of tessellation. And yes. And, and look at the evolution of the, the evolution of the boundaries of the boundaries. Pieces. I see. Where they just go in, mm. in like either direction independently. Uh. Do you know of, of such a continuum limit? Because uh. because this looks very much like okay this this looks like formally like the evolution the curves uh. under mm. under a two dimensional Brownian web even though the two dimensional yeah. Brownian motion don't meet but that's right but this is kind of the evolution of curves under this flow. Yeah, I I haven't seen anything of this type uh, because in two dimension depending on whether the constraints because maybe.